Well, hey, thanks for coming out. Such a great event. Um, you're nowhere near as excited as I am for all this. So, uh, anyways, um, my name is Josh Antonuccio, and I'm an instructor in the School of Media Arts and Studies here at Ohio University. Um, we're really excited to present today's event uh, to you in conjunction with the School of Music. So I'm going to read this so I don't forget who I want to thank. It's kind of like those Oscar speeches. I've been in the bathtub every night, three days. Trying to figure out what am I going to say at the acceptance speech? Um, so uh, first of all, just thanks to the School of Media Arts and Studies for helping to put this together. Director Drew McDaniel, Jeff Redifer, Eddie Ashworth, Kyle Snyder. Thanks for everything you've done to make this thing happen. Also thanks to Andy Traxel in the School of Music. Especially Tim Peacock and Brian Costco for rocking it at Stewart's Opera House. Who all is going to the show tonight? You should all be there. So doing great stuff in our region. Um, if you're not familiar with Stewart's Opera House, you can visit them at stewartsoperahouse.org. Tickets are still available, so you can get some at the door. Also thanks to Stephen Van Dyne, Sean Livingston, Caitlin Stone, and the other students who have been helping to make this thing work. Also uh, Bill Ivan and the students at OU student-run record label Brick City Records for helping with promoting the event. Um, if you want to learn more about the School of Media Arts and Studies, you can go to mediaschool.ohio.edu to learn about our program and why we're offering events like this. Well, in 1997, after I graduated from Ohio University, my wife and I moved to upstate New York. And my good friend and college roommate sent me a cassette tape, as he was wont of doing, of all the new music he was excited about. I trusted his sense, not only because we were friends, but because uh, he turned me on to some great bands, including Gotta By Voices, <coughs> Pavement, Super Chunk, and Brainiac. And uh, this tape, on the end of the first side, uh, there was this band I had not heard before. Uh, it was personal and intimate. It was lush. It was spacious. It was raucous and dangerous, but also completely absorbing. That band was Yellow Tango. From the Velvet Underground to My Bloody Valentine, from 60s folk to 90s noise pop, from the Kinks to Kraut Rock, all these genres came together in this one band. And now 16 years from that day and almost 30 years since they first stepped on stage at the legendary Maxwell's, they show little sign of letting up. At the outset of 2013, Yellow Tango released their 13th album, Fade, great record, which debuted at number 26 on the US charts and has topped the critics' lists for the year. An especially impressive feat for a band that has navigated their path and pretty much dictated success on their own terms for the entirety of their career. And by the way, that album is available at our own Office Records. You should go pick it up. Uh, Yellow Tango started the year with performance on Jimmy Fallon with SNL alum Fred Armisen on drums. Since then, they have embarked on a worldwide tour, which includes dates in Europe, Japan, Mexico, and have shared bills with the likes of Bell and Sebastian, Beach House, and Calexico. As well, they have headlined some of the biggest festivals of the year, including Pitchfork Fest in Chicago, Wilco's Solid Sound Festival, last month's FYF Fest in Los Angeles, and actually again this week, they're heading to Denver for Riot Fest, where they'll be sharing the stage with the newly assembled replacements, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and Public Enemy. The first biography of the band, which came out last year, entitled Big Day Coming, Yolo Tango and the Rise of Indie Rock, um, is fantastic and documents the history and the amazing feats of this band. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ira Kaplan to Ohio University. <laughs> I don't want to get off on the wrong foot, but I, was, I thought I was very specific that there should be four pianos here. <laughs> I thought the harpsichord would take care of two of those. That's beautiful Fair in the back. So actually, I see that uh, Donkey Coffee left you and the band a gift basket for Sorry. you to take with you. That's very thoughtful. Yes. So, I, so we were talking on the way down. You guys have been to the area, but never to Athens. And uh, so Stewart's Opera House, has been the venue where you guys have played for, this will be your second time, and then the Nelson Music, Music Fest in 2011. So, the area, what have you thought of coming down here? We love us? the bike path, we love the opera house. It uh, seems like a very nice place. Very cool, very cool. So, um, We did a little shopping at Rockies earlier yeah. today. That was the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm expecting to see full camo gear at the show tonight, so. Actually, uh, our, one of our, um, our crew members nearly got arrested this morning. He was, uh, 
admiring the trains in Nelsonville, and uh, I guess the caretaker thought he was admiring them too closely and called the cops. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be an unfortunate event. So, um, so 30 years as a band, um, and this year is one of the biggest. The de you've debuted the most, the highest chart position you've had uh, for an album release. But also, it's a year of transition. Maxwell is closing, which is really kind of the crucible for your development as a band and for so many legendary, legendary artists. What, can you talk a little bit just about Maxwell's and the role that's played in the development of your career? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, it it kind of had, um, I mean, if Maxwell's probably roughly the size of this room, if it held 200 people uncomfortably, terrible sight lines, uh, it, you know, by description, uh, kind of a terrible place to see a show, but in reality, the best place to see a show and managed to survive CBGB, survive, I mean, all the, it, it was going in the late 70s and just kept going through first the owner, Steve Fallon, and then uh, the subsequent owner, Todd Abramson, who just, you know, it was just a room that was programmed with love. If you ever spent any time at CBGB's <laughs> beyond wearing the t-shirt, there, wa there wasn't a lot of love that you felt in the, in the programming. It just kind of was there. But Maxwell's always a very personal place. So much that um, our band was allowed to form there, even though we had no idea what we were doing. And uh, just because we were friends with the people there. This is a long time ago. But we played, at one point, we played every week for a month. We opened lot. We, we played all the time when we were a terrible, terrible group, just because we were friends with the people there, and, it, and, and which in a certain sense sounds bad, but in another sense it was, it was a very personal, homey place, and uh, which, which I thought, which was very special, and I, I mean, I, maybe, I, I don't feel like it was that cliquish, I think anybody who wanted to, who felt at home there was welcome, but uh, later, it's later, significance in our development was in uh, 2001 we came up with the idea of playing these shows where we'd play all eight nights of Hanukkah and uh, and we did them there it was kind of like playing at home and so that was uh, we would do these kind of ambitious spectacular shows with comedians and guest stars and we had a uh, People like uh, David Byrne and Connor Oberst, you know, came on, and and I mean, there's a long list of people like uh, Britt Daniel, uh, Ray Davies, Ronnie Spector. I mean, just an incredible list of people who we would back, and no one would know they're going to be there until they just show up, and there they are. And great comedians, like you mentioned, Fred Armisen before, but uh, Patton Oswalt and Sarah Silverman, David Cross. Uh, we got Chris Elliott to perform. Chris Elliott, who never performs live, somehow we talked him into performing at one of our shows. So um, those shows were not only fun to do, but for, for us, it kind of gave us this freedom to, to try anything. And we would have lots of people, like uh, one show, Jeff Tweedy came and was the opening act. And then he played half the set with us. In fact, that whole, that year, we had three different members of Wilco. Uh, uh, Michael Jorgensen played with us one set. Nels Klein played another. And there was no time to rehearse. We would just kind of run over a couple of songs very quickly and, you know, hope that those guys are amazing. It should be interesting. And, you know, maybe you don't want to release the live album, but, uh, <laughs> but it'll be an experience. And so just finding out just what can happen if you just try something that you almost know how to do. And I think that could have only happened at Maxwell's, to bring it around to your question. Well, that's part of the story of Yellow Tango that I, I find so interesting and, uh, and compelling, that you guys really formed out of community. That, you know, it wasn't just the music. It's like you're playing softball with the feelies, and you're, having, you're living with members of the DBs, and you're all kind of growing in this atmosphere where a whole new genre is being created in the midst of it. And I've, I think I've come to the conclusion that Yolo Tango is like the Forrest Gump of indie rock. Like, you guys experienced all of these trends up through your experiences at CBGB's and then Maxwell's and everything that developed and all the people now that kind of look back at you guys and 
respect you as kind of, I've read the, the royalty of indie rock. And uh, so, uh, I, it's, <laughs> which, is a, which is a title you seem to, to wear well. So. Um, so yeah, talk a little bit about the community, what that was like you know, at an early age, going to some amazing shows as a music fan at CBGB's, but then also the, when your era of doing live sound at Maxwell's and the shows you promoted there, what you kind of saw unfolding before you. Well, we were, uh, we were at the, we were in Cleveland yesterday, we went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we were very excited to see a flyer of a show that me and a partner promoted that Georgia did the flyer for, it was on display, a <laughs> replacements uh, flyer, so, um, which we think was their first New York uh, show, it might have been. Uh, well, one thing about the, the social world which we grew out of, which I agree with completely, is I think that's one of the reasons why it took us so long to actually form a band, because it seemed kind of impossible to me. It wasn't, I mean, the, I, I knew people who had placed ads, and if you've read our liner notes carefully, we, we tried doing that as well, placing ads, but we did it very half uh, acidly. We, we didn't really expect to find anybody. It was almost more like performance art. We did place one ad which said that the Velvet Underground seeks bass player, must have own bass, just to see who would call. <laughs> And we did get one call from somebody kind of purporting to know John Cale. And, and we, I don't know why we didn't tape all the calls, but, um, <laughs> but you could almost see that if, if there was any truth to it, it was like John Cale sitting at home going, oh, it would be just like that fucker Lou to put the band back together without me. <laughs> I, it's a New Jersey number, so maybe not. I don't know. So, uh, but... But, you know, I think as far as the shows I saw, I mean, I think everybody, I mean, all of you will, will have the experience 10 years from now where people will be jealous of the sh shows you saw that, uh, that they, they missed. I think that's kind of true for everybody. I mean, you know, I know people who saw the Beatles. I didn't, you know, I know people who saw the Velvet Underground and I didn't. I, you know, talked to uh, the members of the Feelies and they talk about going to see the New York Dolls with the Modern Lovers opening. And I'm like, well, wait, we're the same age. I could have been at that show. I'm too stupid to have gone to that one. So, you know, there's, there, all of us love music and so we went to a lot of shows. And, uh, and then in, the, in my case, I started, as you said, promoting a few shows, but working sound at Maxwell's, which made me uh, privy to a lot of great shows and a lot of god-awful shows. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it, it, some of what we saw, I don't think had that much to do with the band forming. The band really, it was the Feelies and the DBs, uh, who, those two bands in particular who we became friendly with and were extremely supportive of us. The first recording that Georgia and I ever did way before we had a, had a band was we went to um, uh, Glenn Mercer of the Feelys house where there was a four track in his basement and, uh, and Bill Million recorded us doing two songs and he like added guitar on it and added percussion. It was like, wow, this sounds like music. I mean, it, it certainly didn't before he did. But just the kind of, and, and the members of the DBs were very supportive of us because uh, we were extremely, extremely timid and didn't, you know, I don't think we knew how to put together a band with people we didn't know and all the people we knew were in bands. So it seemed impossible and with their support, I mean, with Gene Holder, who produced some of our records later, uh, you know, I think he liked our music more than we did. I mean, it was, so it was very helpful in that regard. So it's also interesting to me that when I was reading through the biography that, you know, through that whole period in the 80s, I mean, you went through 14 bass players or so? Who's counting, right? Until you got to James. Yeah. And, but at the same time, there's this other story that's unfolding of all the relationships that are developing because you have such a love for music and you're such genuine music fans, all these people around you that would later develop the kind of infrastructure of the music industry later, people associated with Mad Door Records, Ryan Schreiber of Pitchfork Media, who 
when he started that, I mean, I think the review for I Can Hear, Hear the Heart Beating as One was one of the second things he posted and basically said, you're the band that everybody needs to hear. And so all these people that were advocates of you kind of as the music industry transformed, that's the other side of it. It's amazing to me how those people really ended up becoming kind of your biggest advocates. Well, Gerard Cosloy, one of the co-owners of Matador, I was uh, editing his record reviews when I think he was 14 years old and I was working <laughs> at New York Rocker. And uh, I, remember, I remember the one specifically was uh, his review of Generic Flipper and uh, he had a whole hammer metaphor. And I remember we were kind of you know, honing it. It was like ball peen hammer. I think we want to go with ball peen hammer. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what to say beyond yes. <laughs> but also, and as you were talking the way down, like, it's like in the world of comedy, I mean, you have these kind of, I mean, Saul Goodman on Breaking Bad is now, Bob Odenkirk is, was a huge fan of you guys when you first met. Well, that was, that was a, we, George and I went to uh, um, L.A. on a vacation when um, right before the second season of Mr. Show started. And we had seen a little bit of the first season, but it hadn't really, uh, it hadn't grabbed us yet. But, um, but we loved the Larry Sanders show, and he has an amazing uh, character on that where he's the Larry's hotshot agent, Stevie Grant. And we saw that, that he was doing, Bob, uh, Bob Odenkirk was doing stand-up in a bookstore. So we thought, oh, well, you know, we'll go to a bookstore. And uh, it was a border, so it had a big records collection, too. And, he, and on stage, he mentioned that they were getting paid in a gift certificate. And it really was not our personality to go up to somebody and say, oh, we're really big fans. But it was, it was there's a guy, like, who's about to be given rec free records and and it's a bookstore. I mean, by comparison, you know, this is like the La Scala Opera House. I mean, it was so <laughs> informal that it it was it would have just felt so deflating to have walked out of there. We would have felt so bad about ourselves. <laughs> so we did. I went up to him and and said that I was in a band and he knew the band, which I I thought he was lying. That's one of the things. If it's just like a showbiz story, uh, a showbiz tip for you, that um, if you ever form a band, you will s tell somebody that you'll meet somebody, you'll say, oh, I'm in a band, I don't know if you've heard of us, and the answer is always yes, because if the person has heard of you, they'll say yes, and if they haven't heard of you, they'll be polite, and they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, sure, that's great. So, of course, <laughs> he said he had heard of us, because, you know, he's a show business professional, but then it turned out he said, oh, I saw you. And he named some little club in Bloomington, Indiana. And I was like, we've actually played that club. Like, how did you, how did you pick that one at random? So it seemed to be true. <laughs> uh, but, but I think, and, and there, I think it, it is, and this is, and this is well before the, the, um, the Hanukkah shows, but I guess there is some aspect to where I mean, we did start playing with comedians. We did a, a show with Todd Barry pretty early on, and it was at Maxwell's. It was like, we're playing at Maxwell's. There's no place to put the equipment to make room for the opening act. Why don't we get a comedian to play? That I mean, that'll be different, and that'll be, I mean, it, hardly unprecedented, but, but still, it seemed, it was unusual in our world, and it, it, we just did it more and more, and, did the video, I don't know if anyone's seen our video with Bob and David, which I won't really recommend too much of our own material, but I will wholeheartedly recommend this video we did with them. And uh, so it just, you know, just, but it wasn't like trying to be different. It was just trying to, it, it's, it would sort of be something that seemed a little scary and a little fun or a lot fun. So once James gets involved with the band in the early 90s, talk a little bit about the transition to Matador, how that helped you guys kind of break through. They had now the marketing arm of Atlantic working for you guys and, and somewhat of a budget now to kind of put behind you. And so what was that process some like? Some of that's not, there's, some of that I think is true and some's not true. And I, I hope, I don't think there's anything wrong with what I'm about to say, but hopefully there isn't. Um, 
Well, James, when James joined, he was whatever the number was, the 14th, the 15th bass player, but he was also playing in this great band, Christmas, and uh, and we didn't, we thought he was like so many other people in our group, just going to fill in for a while and then go back to being his real band, and uh, and it didn't work out that way. He, he um, so the first record we made together, May I Sing With Me, was the record where he was just kind of the fill-in guy playing the songs he had played on tour. But then Christmas was having tremendous difficulty with IRS records that they were on. And in fact, the record that IRS rejected came out years later on Matador, sort of semi-coincidentally and semi-not-coincidentally, because Gerard was always a big supporter of theirs. Um, so James, we were all enjoying playing together, and he decided to move to Brooklyn and really be in our group. So we started, as I've said before, completely seriously, that's when we really became a group. It was like seven years after we were together. We thought we were a group before that, but we found out the difference. And we started practicing every day instead of, oh, we've got a gig, can we talk the other can we talk the bass player into two practices and we'll negotiate at one, you know? And now all of a sudden we're just practicing and practicing all the time. And in the course of it, we started, I mean, in, it was slightly different than the way the band became because the songs we were working on, Georgia and I had like written most of them already, but nobody had played them except the three of us and we, ripped them apart and we just played them a lot and redid them and the, the the record that came out on Matador called Painful came together very slowly and completely differently than any other set of songs we'd ever done and in doing it we figured out that it was going to be like night and day better than anything we'd ever done uh, with you know maybe the exception of our fake book record which is so different that you know, I've always understood why somebody would say that's their favorite record. But anyone who said they liked our other records more than Painful, I'd, I'd just tell them they're wrong. Uh, um, and, but we were on a different label. We, weren't, we were on this label, Alias, who had put out May I Sing With Me, and they had also put out a record by our friends Hypno Love Wheel called uh, Angel Food. I think it's either Angel Food or Space Mountain. I can't remember which record. I think it's Angel Food which is just an amazing record, an amazing record that nobody ever heard. And we were like, we can get, even if we make this great record for them, they're not gonna know what to do with it. And we sort of looked into the future and saw, well, this is how, this is how you get bitter and fall apart because you know, there's a ceiling above you. And we had, as I said, we had known Gerard for a long time and we had been in touch with him about different things that never happened. And we said, well, if we were could get free of our contract with Alias, would Matador be interested in us? And he said yes. And to make an extremely long story extremely short, we made that, we were able to do that. So pain, the record Painful was completed before we ever signed with Matador. We borrowed money and recorded it and mixed it. So it was, we signed with them and delivered the record like the next day. Um, the thing about Atlantic, that was, a, that was a significant thing we thought. It turned out not to be. I think it was a, a red herring. Uh, the Atlantic Matador Association, I don't think was very positive for anyone except maybe that it infused Matador with some money. But in terms of the records that they quote unquote worked. I don't think anybody had any great success with it. They matter or quickly made a subsequent deal with capital that may have been marginally better, but you know, I, I don't, I think that was an uneasy collaboration, but, I, but I'm not that, I don't know that much about that stuff, that side of it. So you mentioned the production on Painful. Can you talk about how Roger, your producer, his presence on that record and on the Future Records kind of took you forward in terms of the sound you were trying to coalesce around? Well, we took, for one thing, we had longer to make that record. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, maybe because we had no deadline, all the other records, we, but we had a budget for a week of recording and we would, you know, 
do everything quickly and move move on. Uh, this one we just worked and we, for the first time ever, we would record something and then listen to it and go, no, we hate that, Let, and re redo it and rip something up. And we had, um, we were we were singing differently. I mean, it, I don't know, we just, R Roger, it, it was interesting, we had, um, because of going back to your thing about the social side of things, our records up till then had been produced by Gene Holder of the DBs, who's a great producer and a friend of ours, and to our mind, that made it a perfect combination. We had a manager very briefly, and we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but one thing he convinced us of was that we should work with somebody who wasn't a friend of ours, and I think he was exactly right. Was that Jamie? Can yeah, and we became friends with Roger, but at first he was, in fact, we brought a co-producer on that record, Fred Brockman, who was a friend of us, because we were afraid to you know, swim in the sea of sharks, of uh, people we didn't already have relationships with. But, uh, but I think there was, we, I think working with Gene, who was a friend, we always felt like he was doing us a favor. Even, when, I don't think he was, but I think it was very hard for us to, to feel like we belong there. But with Roger, <coughs> even though he was the producer, we felt like, well, this is our record. And when we would disagree with Gene, which we did all the time, it still kind of felt like, who are these whippersnappers to tell me what they, sh they think, you know, that the snare drum's too loud or is too much reverb or something. He, he had been working with Lou Reed at that point, isn't that right? Ro he had a, Roger's resume was awesome. He had worked with Lou Reed and the Village People. So we thought, you know, that's perfect. Uh, but we tried all sorts of things. I mean, the, the first song on that record, uh, Big Day Coming, there is a, uh, there is, uh, I, and I, I'm, I hasten to say I haven't heard this in probably 20 years, but I remember doing it, that we went in and put a, a microphone in the bathroom and recorded the sound of the toilet flushing and then put it through all these effect processors and these harmonizers and it just, came up with this really ethereal, beautiful sound that, you know, just, we, there was like a, an air conditioner that was making a complete racket, so we just recorded it and, you know, did the same thing to it. Just all sorts of ways of trying, you know, what would happen if we did the sound and which we had not approached things that way before. So it seemed like just listening to the sounds of the records, you kind of, and most people, critics would say, you really hit your stride with I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One and really kind of looking at the spaciousness of the sound as well. I was reading uh, recently, uh, somebody asked for your top records, and I, well, Albert Brooks, the comedy record, was number one, which I thought was interesting. And then, but uh, then- That list was probably in alphabetical order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then I noticed that Live Dead, Grateful Dead was in there, and I'd never made the association, association of those two elements of basically the spaciousness, the sound of those, those two records. So how, how have you kind of played that out beyond there? I, I lost you on the question, sorry. So with the, with the Grateful Dead, like I, I, you know, most people don't associate indie rock with that sound. Well, I think... I'm not sure why. I think the Grateful Dead are just one of those things that's kind of loaded. Um, I think, I mean, when I saw television for the first time, that was my first association with them. Like, not only the, the long guitar solos, but the, you know, the 10 minutes of tuning between numbers. I mean, it was like, this is the Grateful Dead. And and not in a bad way. It was one of the things I, I loved about them. But I've, I think people have always, I think it's, I think especially because of the, the deadhead culture, I think people have have strong opinions about the Grateful Dead that are not necessarily informed by having listened to them. <laughs> so uh, it just seemed natural to me to, I, I, you know, the connections didn't seem that odd. And, and I think right now, I mean, all, you know, all the stuff that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, my my connection with modern music is not what it used to be, but um, but uh, MV and EE, I mean, they've got to be Grateful Dead fans. Wooden ships have to be Grateful Dead fans. I mean, I think it's it's, 
And if they're not, they would be. <laughs> so backing up a little bit to the, to the 90s, uh, in the early 90s, so the revolution with sub pop kind of happens. You have bands like uh, well, Nirvana, Soundgarden getting signed. What was it like to be in the midst of that on, to see things that were previously underground now getting kind of thrown into the mainstream and famously Michael Jackson's album getting knocked out of the number one position by Nirvana. I mean, you were- I literally did not know that was true. Uh, I I never felt very connected to that one way or the other. Um, I'm sure it had impact on us, but it it was happening, you know, it was whatever the rising tide was lifting our boat, but uh, I, I don't know, it was not really part of my well, I liked Mud Honey a great deal, but but didn't they sleep on your couch? <laughs> <laughs> they did, yeah. They let our cats out. I'm sure inadvertently. They're very nice people. I don't, I don't think they. Uh, I just remember reading a story that Georgia walked in on them. They're like, "Who are you?" Yeah. And I said, "We're Mud Honey." <laughs> it's true. Um, so, but you did. You were a part of the Lollapalooza tour, kind of in its early. Incarnations. Yeah, we were the, on the last year of the original traveling Lollapalooza thing. Yeah, when it started, it was a traveling. It, it was like all summer. It went from city to city, and uh, the last year, which I guess was '95, was it was headlined by Hole and Sonic Youth, and uh, that year was a financial disaster. And I think that. Lollapalooza went away for a few years, and then when it came back, it was just the weekend in Chicago that it is now. So interesting. It was horrible. I mean, it was it was really it was sort of fun. I'm sure you're looking at me thinking this guy loves sports, and uh, (laughs) uh, so one of the things that I enjoy, and one of the things that makes what we do workable is is when um that sometimes you feel like well this is close i'm ever get going to get to being an athlete and Lollapalooza was kind of like that i'm especially a baseball fan and you know the 162 game long season is all about like you know you got to play hurt you got to lose the the tour was all summer and it would we were on the side stage which was invariably set up in a parking lot so we're like on black tarmac the temperature was like 100,000 degrees every day. And you just get there and just drink water, drink water, drink water until one hour before showtime, drink a beer. And it was like, go on, play for an hour, get off, and then just like, you know, just covered in sweat and then, you know, get in the van and drive to the next city and do it again. The, the, the weekend of the Chicago show we did was a notoriously hot weekend. There were Dozens of people died, not at the show, but it was, and there, you know, there we are, just you know, jumping up and down, playing our songs. So it was, it was sort of horrible, but really fun in that way of like, you know, I'm climbing Mount Everest uh, way. So I read this interesting uh, anecdote in the book that while you were uh, at Lollapalooza in Columbus, Ohio, you were there the day the MP3 was created. Oh, so right. yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think it's an interesting segue, though, to think about, again, when that technology comes into play, how that affects the entire music industry and, and now just the way that we access music, mostly downloading or streaming. How has Yellow Tango just navigated that whole transformation? Mostly the way we navigated grunge by ignoring it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, I, I, we... Um, I'm not sure what one can do. I mean, you can you can get really mad about people not paying for records, and you know, but I don't I don't see what good that will do. <laughs> so other than you know, get you mad. Um, so we just I mean, when we, we this record we put out this year, before we did it, we got together with Matador and asked them if they wanted us to make a record. I mean, is that did that make sense for 2013? Or do you want us to record you know, songs that we'll put out one a month as a download? Just, I mean, we're, we, we, we like working and we work all the time, and, uh, but we want it to be flexible 
as to if, I mean, I think what we did is our preference. We, we were happy that they said we'd like you to make an album that is designed to be listened to from start to finish, whether or not the bulk of the people who experience the record in any way will do it that way. We can all pretend that's what's happening, and they, that's what they wanted, and that's what we preferred. But if they had suggested something else, we would have been interested in meeting that challenge. So, but mostly we just kind of do what we do and hope for the best. Again, that's why I think it's your story is so interesting. Uh, I, in my class, I show a little clip of Greg Calby, your master engineer, talking about the the, the uh, advice he gives to bands that he's working with. That you know, you never want to start a record with a really long song. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think, what does he think when he gets your records? <laughs> Uh, starting with a 10 minute track and, yeah. and yet you've maintained just such an in, intense fan base. Well, I mean, uh, I think t uh, t we've done that twice, started with really long songs and, and I think, I mean, Painful was a very successful record for us and I, and I think somehow it, that song was, um, maybe it helped, I don't know. In the case of the second time we did it, with um, I'm Not Afraid of You and I'll Beat Your Ass, the record that came before that, Summer Sun, was uh, the first time we ever made a record that did worse than the one before it, that was a kind of noticeable drop after uh, I, I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One and, uh, and then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out. So, well, that's which started with a long song too. Uh, but, I, but I think the first song on that record uh, was really one of the more popular ones on it. I think it kind of, people responded to, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a one hour record or, or something, you know, I don't really see if it matters if there's a five second break <laughs> three minutes in, it's still, you know, you're still hopefully gonna be listening for the next 45 minutes. So another interesting fact that I, I learned. I truly about have never thought that that was a problem. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we've been aware of it, but we started with very short ones and very long ones. With that, of all the things, we certain ones just seem to fit. How is it that I never knew that you and Georgia were in the video for Glory Days by Bruce Springsteen? Well, I'm not actually in it. I uh, saw Georgia. Georgia's <laughs> in it. Oh, Georgia's in it. I, we were there. Uh, and that was at Maxwell's. Right? Yeah, if you've uh, if you've seen uh, if you've never been to Maxwell's, but you've seen the Glory Days video, of Bruce Springsteen, that's exactly what Maxwell's does not look like. They came in and <laughs> they uh, set dressed it to look like just a, a dive bar. They put in a pool table. They put tables up on the stage. They ripped out the soundboard, put a stage somewhere else. But uh, but it was a, a, a really fun day, and because we were. Uh, such so connected with the club, we were able to just be there. And uh, so yes, at the very end, uh, Georgia can be seen in the video, but where I was never, uh, Georgia's easy to spot. It's the end of the song when um, uh, all the E Street band and Springsteen are all throwing their fists in the air on, I guess, probably two and four, and everybody in the audience is doing it too. And just look for the one person who's not, and that's Georgia. <laughs> um. Also, is it true that you and the band produced or were hired by Coca-Cola to do a spot for the Olympics? Yeah, the yeah, we've done, we've done a number of commercials. We've, um, you know, that's, 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 uh, for, all, for quite a while we have been asked about, we've obviously, well maybe not obviously, we've, licensed, we've written a lot of music for movies, we've licensed a lot of songs to movies, and the one thing we never wanted to do was license one of our songs to a commercial, but we were happy to write music for a commercial as long as it wasn't something that we had written for another reason. Uh, so we kept, you know, people would ask us, we, we I mean, it's, it's really all we have for it, so I may as well say it. We've turned down a lot of money <laughs> uh, for, uh, for songs because we didn't, they, the song as we wrote it didn't necessarily mean buy this Volkswagen, so we didn't. <laughs> but so, but we always did offer, well, we'll write something for you, and they said no. But then Coca-Cola said yes, and um, so, and, and, and we did it 
honestly, we, we knew what song they wanted and we went in sort of trying to use that as a, as a moment, as, as, a, as a feel. And that, they did, that got, they, we did that and it got shown. We wrote some music for Starbucks for a, a commercial that got shown. The one that didn't get shown was we did one for NASCAR. And, um, <laughs> and for one thing, they offered us a ton of money. So that was good. And the song they wanted was one of our quietest, sweetest songs. And we're like, wow, that's, I did not think that was going to scream NASCAR to you. <laughs> so so we, we said, OK, we'll, we'll write something quiet. And you know, we'll do something in that, what we think of in that mode. And, uh, and they showed us a, uh, a clip of the commercial with our music in it as a temp track and we watched it, I, saw, you know, I guess to get inspiration. And uh, it was, the, the thing was, it, 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 was a, uh, it was the year, it was the previous year's Nash, NASCAR in reverse. And uh, so it started with the, the champion being crowned champion and it ended with uh, somebody going, gentlemen, start your engines. So I was like, okay, that gives me a great idea. So we, we made the thing and at some point I said to George, I said, you know, I feel like you should probably watch this. I don't know why, but they sent it to us, and I, I think we should, in answer to the question, did you see it, the answer should be yes. So she was watching it on our computer, and I wasn't watching, I was just listening, and I could hear that when the voice said, gentlemen, start your engines, I realized it was George W. Bush. And we're like, oh, we didn't realize we were collaborating with President Bush. <laughs> and it felt kind of weird. I mean, we, and, and, you know, we had two things. For one thing, we had said yes, and they had sent us the commercial. They hadn't said, you know, pay close attention to who's saying, gentlemen, start your engines. But they had sent it to us, and we had agreed, so we felt, well, we kind of feel obligated. And then the other thing we were thinking is, well, you know, it's not a commercial for you know, napalm, it's, you know, <laughs> we can all, in, you know, we all enjoy barbecue, we all in, <laughs> enjoy NASCAR, potentially. It, you know, maybe this isn't so bad, but we, but we did talk to the person at Matador, our, our, our uh, contact there about this and say, oh, I really wish we had thought about this part of it. And he said, well, the good news is they haven't cleared him yet. So it may not happen. And, th and they ultimately didn't clear him. But I don't think they ever ran the commercials. So that was a. So beyond licensing for commercials, you guys have really kind of taken off in terms of doing soundtracks for films. And uh, was Adventureland your first major picture you did outside of just independent films? Yes. So what was that process like? Um, it's a mixed process. It's, it's, um, there, there's definitely, I mean, one of the business sides of it that's a complete drag is that it's, uh, you say that's, that it wasn't an independent movie and it was distributed by Disney, so you're right. But anytime they needed it to be independent, they go, oh, we're just Miramax. So it's, it's, it's complete like, you know, you know, try to get the rights to your music. It's like, we're Disney. We keep everything. So it's, they're whatever they want to be at that moment. And so, you know, from a business standpoint and a bureaucracy standpoint, it's not always the most fun thing in the world. But almost coming back to what I said about if Matador had asked us not to make an album, it's an interesting challenge to write music and, you know, put your heart into it and then have somebody come back and say, I don't think it's really working, or we need it to be seven seconds shorter. <laughs> and you have to go, you have to just kind of give up your emotional attachment to it and do it again or rework it. And most of the time, we found that we like the second version better. It, I mean, it's, but, but it, so, so it is, it's a different way of working, it's a different way of thinking, and, uh, and for us, a lot, we hear a lot of the things like on our new record that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been wearing this like soundtrack hat 
on our uh, and thinking a different way. It kind of it opens your brain to. Uh, oops, guys really love Disney. <laughs> um, yeah, so talk a little bit about the process of making the latest record. You worked with a different producer, went to a different studio. What was that like in comparison to working for many years with Roger? Well, we uh, it, was, it was different, but working with Roger was different every time, too. I mean, that's one of the reasons we kept working with him is that the experience always changed. You build on what you've done before. In, I mean, we actually worked in probably uh, four different studios along the five different studios along the way. I mean, so it's not like each one of those was the same. But this time, we just decided. What, in fact, one of the things that uh, when we worked, I, I assume there's people here who have been in studios. The the normal way of recording, the classic way of recording, is. You wear headphones and you separate the drums from the amplifiers so that uh, the sound of the drums doesn't bleed into the guitar track and all that. So when you're mixing, you have the, the freedom to do what you want with the ice, sounds isolated. And that's, of course, how we started recording. But the more we worked with Roger, the less we did that uh, in all of us, but probably me the most, kind of didn't like wearing headphones and wanted to kind of have the, the feeling of playing the way we play at practice and just you know, try to get, make it sound more natural, where I think the normal way is to s try to sound natural with headphones on. Uh, so the last record we made was actually in our rehearsal space. I don't, we, <coughs> I'm sure we didn't have headphones. There was nothing, you know, we did some isolation, but not much. Um, so we went to work with John. We w asked him, how do you, we'll, we'll try to do it however you want. And, uh, and he wanted us to do it the right way. And he said, you know, we'll tr if, if it's not working, we'll do it differently. But we did end up making that record with isolation and the headphones. And there were a lot of positives. It meant we were able to work faster. The, the, the challenges we threw at Roger meant we wasted a lot of takes on mic placement because you'd have to, you'd set up mics and then there, what, the bleed was bad and so you might do a perfectly good performance but it wasn't workable from a technical standpoint so we'd have to reconfigure that. I read the story of the making of Night Falls on Hoboken. Yeah, that was an entire day. And that was, that was one, you had to do a 17 minute take all at once and have people closing doors, opening yeah. doors as you switched instruments. We, I guess we didn't have to, but we wanted to. Uh, the, the, it's a song that we did, it is, it's not only 17 minutes, but it starts very quietly and then uh, an acoustic guitar starts feeding back and the song gets louder. At a certain point, uh, James, our bass player, switches to organ. I switch from guitar to drums. So we basically set things up throughout the entire studio and it was, and because of the feedback, you know, we were, we were walking, it, it really was like choreographed and, and every time we would figure out, solve one problem would cause another one. And I think it did take us an entire day to come up with a strategy for how we could play that song for 17 minutes. And, and that's what we did the next day. It's fantastic. Um, well, I think we have a few minutes left for questions. I think we have a microphone set up over here on the side, so if people want to, anyone wants to make their way down, um, go ahead and do that. Um, if anybody comes down, let me, let me just throw out one other thing. Um, so you are off to Riot Fest. Who are you going to be playing alongside of on your specific day? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> It's a, Are you going to go and see the replacements play, or? Probably. Yeah. It depends how much time there is between us and them. If, if there's too much or not enough, I won't. But yeah. I, I'm, in, I'm interested in seeing them, but I'm not hell bent to see them. Yeah. Great. Uh, Go over here. Uh, <clears throat> what was your personal favorite experience when performing live? Uh. Th there are, there's sort of like just too many, too many. I'll tell you the most recent one, which, which was we were just played in Mexico City 
and uh, to a very, a very lively, exuberant audience. A lot of our songs are very quiet. They never quite got quiet, but they did. They were still in it. They weren't kind of like bored. I mean, they were, they were just exuberant in a great way. And we were doing probably our quietest song. And it's got a, a long acoustic guitar solo that I was doing, and I'm really like concentrating on. And I see something out of the corner of my eye, and uh, somebody had thrown a bra on stage. <laughs> which, uh, once again, I know you're looking at me thinking, well, that's probably four shows out of five. But, um, <laughs> and I was like, wow. Nearly 30 years, and uh, there's still surprises in this world. So that was... <laughs> So you guys like switch up a lot, like uh, James will play organ on some songs. And, uh, like, when you do that sort of thing, uh, do you guys ever argue about like who's like gonna do what live? Like, or, like have arguments like that? Like who's the person in the band that has to put the foot down the most? To like say, you do this, you do that. I don't that think, I don't think it's ever, I, can't, I, I honestly can't remember an argument about that. I mean, sometimes, uh, and, and we've worked at, it's, things have changed when, um, over the course of doing songs. We'll do songs differently where he, sometimes, uh, I mean, I, I, the, the song that really leaps to mind was uh, on our Summer Sun record, there's a song called uh, Season of the Shark, and that one, what James's role in that song was going to be took a long time to to figure out. And at some point, we we bought bass pedals, and he was playing bass with his feet and acoustic guitar, and that just seemed it, it it didn't it wasn't flowing. And then we tried him on bass, and I think we did that for a long time. But then, uh, more recently, we started using acoustic 12-string guitar, which he plays quite a bit now. And I think he started playing the acoustic 12-string guitar on that. And I think that, so that's the current version. But it doesn't tend to be an argument, because I think we're, it's not like one person goes, I think it sounds great. And someone else says, are you kidding? Are you, you, know, you must be a fool. That sounds terrible. Like, you know, it, we, we can tell when, when something's, working and when it's not so you know definitely things things i mean there's there's a lot of songs like tonight that we could play in one of two ways and sometimes more than two ways like which version we'll do is dictated by its spot in the set what we've been doing lately uh so there's i, it, it, I don't know it just kind of happens there's not that much fighting we fight about other things. <laughs> 